So, I've got my uh, cheapest charger I could find trying to charge my laptop. Ugh. Not doing a very good job. But, anyway, I am going to try to get this chapter off to you then before my, uh, whew, before my laptop dies. So, this is book six of the Dresden Files. This is Blood Rites. Today what we are on is on chapter seven. If you've missed the other ones, do go ahead, hurry up, go take a look at those before you jump into this, because there's a lot going on. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to miss much of it at all. So, let's go ahead and jump into chapter seven here. Yeah, because I've already lost 4%, so I don't know if I'm going to even make it to the end of this. So you guys probably aren't going to be seeing this, but if you are... Laugh at me in. I made it to the end. <clears throat> Chicago is a business town. Entrepreneurs of every stripe duke it out ferociously in pursuit of the American dream, discarding the carcasses of fallen ventures along the way. The town is full of old business headquarters, most of them held by the long-term commercial giants. When a new business sets its sights on Second City, it's cheaper for them to settle in one of the newer industrial parks littered around the city's suburbs. They all look more or less alike. A grid of plain, blocky, readily um, adaptable buildings, two or three stories high with no windows, no landscaping, and gravel parking lots. They look like enormous, ugly, concrete bricks, but they're cheap. Arturo had acquired a short-term lease on such a building in such an industrial complex 20 minutes west of town. There were three other car cars parked in its lot by the time I got there. I had a nylon backpack full of various magic tools I might need to ward off malevolent energies. Salt, a bunch of white candles, holy water, a ring of keys, a small silver bell, and chocolate. Yeah, chocolate. Chocolate fends off all kinds of nasty stuff. And if you get hungry while warding off evil, you have a snack. It's a multi-purpose equipment. One end of my carved wooden blasting rod protruded from the backpack in case I needed to make a fast draw. I was also wearing my shield bracelet, my mother's pentacle amulet, my force ring, and a new gizmo I'd been working with a silver belt buckle carved into the shape of a standing bear. Better to have the magical arsenal and not need it, than not have it and get killed to death. I got out of the car, had on a pair of slacks and a polo shirt, since I had no idea of what a production assistant on an adult film set was supposed to wear. The client would have to be happy with business casual. I slung the backpack over one shoulder and locked up the car. A second car pulled up as I did. A shiny green rental number and parked next to the Blue Beetle. Two men got out. The driver was a fit looking man, maybe in his late thirties. He was a little taller than average and had the build of someone who works out in non fantastic kind of way. His medium brown hair was long enough to look a little disheaved. He wore round rimmed spectacles a Nike t-shirt, and Levi's, and his cross trainers probably cost him upwards of a hundred bucks. He nodded at me and said, Good morning, in a tone of genuine cheer. Hi, I responded. New guy, he asked. New guy. Cameraman? Stunt double. Cool, he grinned, pulled a designer labeled gym bag out of the back of the rental car, and slung it over his shoulder. He approached, offering his hand. I'm Jake. I traded grips with him. His hands the, had the calluses of someone who had worked with them, and he had a confidence that conveyed strength without attempting to crush my fingers. I liked him. Harry, I responded. The second man who got out of the rental car looked like a weightlifting commercial. He was tall and built like a statue of Hercules beneath tight leather pants and a sleeveless workout shirt. He had high-tech tan, coal-black hair, 
and wasn't old enough to qualify for decent rates on his auto insurance. His face didn't match the Olympian body. His features rated on the western slope of the bell curve of physical appeal. Though, to be fair, he was staring at me with a murderous scowl, which probably biased my opinion. Who the hell are you? He growled. I the hell am Harry, I said. He pulled out his own gym bag and slammed the car door closed. You always a wise ass? No, sometimes I'm asleep. He took a pair of hard steps toward me and thrust the heel of one hand at my shoulder in a belligerent push. Classic macho jiu-jitsu. Uh, I could have done a bunch of fairly violent things in response, but I try not to get into fights in a gravel parking lot if I can help it. I took the push without yielding and grunted. Wrists is a little limp, I said. If you like, I can show you an exercise or something, help you out. His face twisted with abrupt heat. Son of a bitch! The man swore and dropped his bag so he could ball his huge hands into huge fists. Whoa! Jake said and stepped between us, facing the big guy. Hey, come on, Bobby. It's too early for this crap. Bobby got a lot more aggressive once Jake was there to hold him back, snarling and cussing. I'd faced too many literal ogres to be terribly impressed by a metaphorical one. But I was just as glad that it hadn't gone any further. The kid was a hell of a lot stronger than me. And if he knew uh, more than nothing about how to handle himself, he could ruin my whole day. The kid subsided after a minute, picked up his stuff again, and scowled at me. I know what you're thinking, and you can forget it. I lifted my eyebrows. So you're psychic too? Wise-ass stump double, he snarled. It happened once. You aren't going to make a name for yourself. You might as well just leave now. Jake sighed. Bobby, he's not a stunt double. But he said he was joking. Jake said, Christ, he's newer at this than you. Look, just go inside. Get some coffee or spring water or something. You don't need this on a shooting day. The kid glared at me and jabbed his index finger at me. I'm warning you, asshole. Stay out of my way if you don't want to get hurt. I tried to keep up all the panic and terror he'd inspired off my face. Okie dokie. The kid snarled, spat on the ground in my direction, and then stormed inside. Someone woke up with his testosterone in a knot today, I said. Jake watched Bobby go and nodded. He's under pressure. Try not to take it personal, man. That's tough, I said. What with the insults and the violent posturing and such? Jake grimaced. Nothing to do with you personally, man. He's worried. About being replaced by a stunt double? Yeah. Are you serious? What the hell does a stunt double do in a porno flick? Jake waved a hand vaguely toward his belt. Extreme close-ups. Uh, what? Historically speaking, it doesn't happen often. Especially with what with Viagra now. But it isn't unknown for a director to bring in a double for those close of a scene if the actor is having trouble finishing. I blinked. He thought I was a stunt penis? Jake laughed at my reaction. Man, you are new. You been doing this work long? A while, he said. Guess it's a dream job, eh? Gorgeous swimming and all? He shrugged. Not as much as you'd think. After a while, anyway. Then why do you do it? Habit, he asked with an easy grin. Plus, lack of options. I thought about doing the family thing once, but it didn't work out. He fell silent for a second, his expression touched with faint grief. He shook his head to come out of it and said, Look, don't worry about Bobby. He'll calm down once he figures out his stage name. Stage name? Yeah, I think that's what's got him all nervous. This is only his second shoot. First one is in the can, but it'll be a bit before they do final edits and such. He's got until next week to figure out his performing name. 
performing name, huh? Don't make fun of it, he said, expression serious. Names have power, man. Do they really? Jake nodded. A good name inspires confidence. It's important for a young guy. Like Dumbo's magic feather, I said. Right, exactly. So, what name do you go by? I asked. Jack Rock... Jack Rockhardit, Jake replied promptly. He eyed me for a moment, his expression assessing. What? I asked. You mean you don't recognize the name? Or me? I shrugged. I don't have a TV. Don't go to those theaters either. His eyebrows shot up. Really? Are you Amish or something? Yeah, that's it. I'm Amish. He grinned. Maybe you'd better come inside with me. I'll introduce you around. Thanks. No problem, Jake said. We went on into the building, a place with sterile beige walls and invincible medium brown carpeting. Jake led me to a door with a computer printed sign that read Green Room and went inside. A long conference table ran down the center of the comfortably sized room. Donuts, drinks, fruits, bagels, and other foods of every description were laid out on trays down its length. The room smelled like fresh coffee, and I promptly honed in on the coffee machine for a cup. A plain-faced woman in her mid-forties entered, wearing jeans, a black tee, and a red and white flannel shirt. Her hair was tied back under a red bandana. She seized a paper plate and dumped food on it at random. Good morning, Guffy. Joan, Jake responded easily. Have you met Harry? Not yet. She glanced over her shoulder at me and nodded. Wow, you're very tall. I'm actually a midget. The haircut makes me look taller. Joan laughed and popped a donut hole in her mouth. You're the production assistant, eh? Yes. She nodded. So let's produce. I thought that was Arturo's bag. He's the director and executive producer. I'm the actual producer. Makeup, cameras, lighting, sets, you name it. I handle the crew and the details. She turned to me and offered her hand, shaking off sugary donut goodness as she said, Joan Dallas. Pleasure, I said. Harry Dresden. Joan nodded. Come on then. There's still a lot to do before we can shoot. Guffy, get to the dressing room and clean yourself up. Jake nodded. Are they here yet? Her tone of voice became annoyed. Giselle and Emma are. There was a moment of silence. Pregnant tension. Jake winced and headed for the door. Harry, nice to meet you. Joan's okay, but she'll work you to death. Joan threw an apple at him. Jake caught it when it bounced off his chest, crunched into it with his teeth, and held it in his mouth so that he could wave as he left the room. Grab yourself some food, stilts, Joan said. You can help me put cameras together. I was hoping to talk to Arturo before we got going, I said. She turned around with two plates loaded with breakfast pastries. She hadn't bothered getting any fruit. You're a funny guy. He's probably not out of bed yet. Bring that box of cookies. If my blood sugar drops too low, I might take off your head. She led me down a short hallway to a cavernous room, a shooting studio. A slightly raised stage held an unlit set, which looked like a lavishly appointed bedroom. Arrayed in a line in front of it were several black plastic crates and a freestanding shop light. Joan flicked it on and started opening crates, popping a bit of food into her mouth every third or fourth movement. Nice place, I said. Been a bitch. Joan said between bites. Last company here was supposed to be some kind of computer production deal, but they had to be lying. They redid all the wiring in here, routed in way heavier than they were supposed to have. Took me a week to get things working, and then I had to turn their old gym into something like a dressing room. But this place still isn't up to code. Yeah. Can it change the laws of physics? I said. She laughed. Amen. Engineer, then? I asked. 
By way of necessity, she answered. I've done sets, lighting, power, even some plumbing. And, she said, opening boxes, cameras. Gather round, gopher boy. You can help. I settled down where she laid out parts from heavy plastic crates. She assembled them. Several professional cameras and tripods with the sultry of long practice. She gave me instructions as she did, and I did my best to help her out. There was a pleasant, quiet rhythm to the work, something that I hadn't really felt since the last time I'd been on a farm in Hog Hollow, Missouri, and it was interesting. Technology was unfair territory for me. See, those who wield the primordial forces of creation have a long-running grudge with physics. Electronic equipment, in particular, tends to behave unpredictably. Uh, right up until it shuts down and stops working altogether. Old technologies seemed more stable, which was one reason I drove around town in a Volkswagen Beetle that had been built before the end of the Vietnam War. But newer products video cameras, televisions, cell phones, computers, would die a horrible, fizzling death after any extended time in my presence. There was a sense of order to what we were doing that appealed to me in some level. Putting parts together, locking them into place, lining up plugs into their corresponding sockets, taping groups of wires together so that they wouldn't get tangled. I did well enough that Joan sat back and watched me work on the last camera on my own. So, how is this supposed to work? I said. What happens next? The lights, she sighed. The damned lights are the most annoying part. We have to set them up so that no one looks too shiny or too wrinkly. Once that's done, I'll let the technical manager handle sound and go ride herd on the actors. Metaphorically, I hope. She snorted. Yes, some of them are decent enough, like the blockheaded Guffy. But if you don't push them into getting things done, you'll never be ready for the set on time. Makeup, costumes, that sort of thing. Ah, and some of them are late, I asked. Scrump will be, she said. It almost came out with a growl. I pushed. Who? Teresa Scrump, actress. You don't like her, I asked. I despise that self-absorbed, egotistical little bitch, Joan said cheerfully. She'll pay, play the princess and everyone else in the cast will know what they don't have to show up on time. Or be ready to go on time. Or be entirely sober, since her lascivious highness, Trixie Vixen, will be showing up late to everything anyway. High as a kite and doing exactly as she pleases. I long to slap her silly. You shouldn't repress your emotions like that, I said. She let out a billy laugh. Sorry, no reason to drag a newbie into old politics. Guess I'm just upset to be working with her again. I didn't expect it. Ah, hostility from the porn starlet. That's what we in the business call motive. Joan did not strike a creepy, murder murderous Straga vibe with me, but I'd learned the hard way that a skilled liar can look innocent right up until she stabs you in the back. I dug for more information, like a good investigator. Why not? She shook her head. When Arturo left Silverlight Studios to start his own company, he made a lot of people angry. What do you think about that? The move, I mean. She sighed. Arturo is an idiot. He's a kind man, and he means well, but he's an idiot. Anyone who works with him now risks getting blacklisted by Silverlight. Even Trixie? I, I mean, if she's a big star, won't the studio kind of kowtow to her? One second, guys. I want to see if I can... Uh... Yeah, I 
didn't think so. This is why, guys, when you're uh, out buying or uh, getting a computer, you should uh, <laughs> you should probably get the higher wattage charger if you lose your charger because it'll help keep your uh, computer going. What's going on right now is. Uh, my computer is saying that it is uh, dead. In fact, it's saying <laughs> we're down to 5%. So let me hopefully finish these last three pages really quick. And I really want to apologize if this one uh, goes bad. I definitely won't play it. But... <clears throat> Let's see. Even Trixie? I mean, if she's a big star, won't the studio kind of kowtow to her? Joan leaned down to check a connection I'd made, shoving the plug in. Are you on drugs or something? She's a big star with a limited shelf life. They'd replace her without blinking. She sounds gutsy. Joan shook her head. Don't confuse courage with stupidity. I think she's vapid enough to actually believe she's too important to lose. If I didn't know better, I'd say you don't like her much. Doesn't matter, matter whether I like her or not, Joan said. It's my job to work with her. I watched her set her mouth in a firm line as she started closing cases and stacked them up. I was willing to bet that Trisha Scrump, a.k.a. Trixie Vixen, didn't have the same kind of professional resolve. I helped Joan pick up the crates and tools and stack them against the far wall of the dim studio. She moved briskly, tension and distaste simmering under the surface of her determined expression. I studied her as covertly as I could. She clearly wasn't happy to be here. Could be gunning for a Turo. With some kind of heavy-duty entropy curse? It didn't track. There hadn't been any hostility when she spoke about Arturo. And if she were a strong enough practitioner to throw out deadly spells, she wouldn't be able to keep up a career amidst so much technology. If she was harboring vengeful feelings towards Arturo, she was the best actress I'd ever seen. I suppose that could have been possible, but in my my instincts were sending me mixed messages. On the one hand, they told me that Joan was on the level. On the other, they also told me there was more to the woman than met the eye. Something told me that things were more serious than they appeared. That this situation was even more dangerous than I had originally believed. It bothered me. It bothered me a lot. Joan shut the last case and interrupted my train of thought. Okay, then, she said. Let's get the studio powered up. Um, I said, maybe I shouldn't be here when you do. She lifted her eyebrows, evidently waiting for an explanation. Uh, I said, I have a plate in my head. It's a little twitchy around electric fields. High voltage equipment, that kind of thing. I'd rather come in when it was already up and running, so I can back off if there starts to be a problem. Joan stared at me with a lot of skepticism. Is that so? Yeah. She frowned. How did you get this job? Christ, I'm a terrible liar. I tried to think of an answer that didn't begin with, um, but I was interrupted. A surge of silent, invisible energy swept through the room, 
cold and foul. My stomach twisted with an abrupt nausea, and my skin erupted in goose flesh. Dark, dangerous magic swirled by, drawing my attention to the studio's exit. It was the kind of magic that destroys, warps, rots, and corrupts. The kind of magic you'd need to feed a deadly entropy curse. What's wrong? Joan shook me with one hand. Harry, you're shaking. Are you all right? I managed to choke out. Who else is in the building? Jake, Bobby, Emma, and Giselle. No one else. I stumbled to my pack and picked it up. If Joan hadn't helped me balance, I might have fallen down. Show me where. Joan blinked in confusion. What? I shoved the sensation of the dark magic away as best I could and snarled. They're in danger. Now show me where. My tone might have alarmed her, but her expression became more worried than frightened. Joan nodded and half ran out of the studio, leading me out a side door, up a flight of metal spiral stairs, and into another hallway. We sprinted down a room with a sign on it that said, Dressing Room. Get back, I said, and stepped in front of her. I hadn't yet touched the doorknob when a woman began to scream. Thank you for listening to Chapter 7 with me. Hopefully, with everything that's going on with my laptop, that didn't go too crazy. Um, if it did, then I won't be publishing this one, and I'll have to reread it. But if it didn't, thank you guys for sticking it out with me. Thank you very much for listening to my channel and listening to Chapter... What was that? Seven? Yep, Chapter 7 of Blood Rites, Dresden Files, Book 6. Thank you, and you guys have a wonderful and blessed day.